Well, and good morning to you, everyone. This is Russ Barkley, finally back after nearly a two-week layoff. I was taking care of grandchildren yet again, and so had to delay my research reviews with you. Also, it's hotter than blazes here in Richmond, and so I'm dressed appropriately with my new tropical shirt. Hope you like it. It does help to fill out the background, doesn't it? I'm also recording in a new studio within my home that I hope is going to be more soundproofed and less subject to echo or reverb. So you let me know if that's a problem. But I think things should be working out pretty well here. All right, as always, we're going to start with our dad jokes. Uh, in this case, we're going to borrow some from the website of boardpanda.com. Your first dad joke this morning is, what do you call someone with no body and no nose? Well, as it says here, nobody knows. Yeah, I know that one was pretty stupid, but you know, here's one for you. My daughter screeched, dad, you haven't listened to one word I've said, have you? What a strange way to start a conversation with me. So. <laughs> okay, that's that's pretty bad. I, I Don't shoot me again, uh, just the messenger here. So let's get started with our research review. <clears throat> First up is going to be an article that is a review of the literature on the effects of judo on ADHD symptoms. Let me just blow it up here. It actually also includes research on other neurodevelopmental disorders like autism spectrum and so on, but we're going to concentrate on the ADHD findings. And uh, after identifying more than 80 studies in the literature, eliminating some of the duplications, they narrowed it all down to about 16 studies. And quite frankly, the studies they chose to include were not all that rigorous. But nonetheless, what they found is that individuals, children in this case, who practiced judo were found to have improvements in their symptoms of neurodevelopmental disorder and specifically ADHD. And they talk about that there were improvements not only in terms of physical activity, of course, but also social interactions, emotional well-being, and cognitive functioning among those receiving judo. So uh, that's very nice, but here's a few problems with this. Most of these studies were not very rigorous. They didn't include control groups of people doing other forms of activity or exercise to see if it specifically is the judo practice or it's just exercise in general. We've talked on this channel repeatedly about the value of exercise and helping manage ADHD symptoms. It's possible that that's really all they found here. Uh, in addition to that, having thrown out most of the research, uh, it's hard to say how representative the findings are from the, I think it was about 16 studies out of those 81 studies are representative of the field. So I, I, I just don't know. But in any case, uh, this suggests that judo practice may help manage ADHD. I have a feeling what it shows is yet again, exercise is beneficial. So uh, let's close that tab and move on to our next one, which is a study on comorbid health conditions in people with ADHD. This is a review of all of the other reviews, including other meta-analyses. So uh, often called an umbrella review. So it's including studies that focus on more than 76 different health outcomes that might be linked to ADHD. They found 22 different meta-analyses. So lots and lots of research out there on the health consequences linked to ADHD. Now, what they found, of course, is what I talked about in my videos on this channel under the lecture on health outcomes of ADHD. Uh, and this just reaffirms all those earlier findings, and that is that ADHD is associated with an increase in neurological conditions, such as epilepsy, for instance, psychiatric disorders, we already knew that, sleep problems, yes, we've talked about that before, increased risk of suicide. Talked about that here as well. There's an increase in metabolic disorders, musculoskeletal disorders, oral disorders. We talked about the dental health of people with ADHD being less 
adequate and allergic reactions. I've spoken about atopic dermatitis as well as rhinitis and other autoimmune reactions being linked with ADHD, and then of course, visual difficulties as well. The review also highlights the fact that yet again, ADHD was found to be linked to a greater risk of mortality across the lifespan. Most of that being the result of accidental injuries associated with risk-taking and misadventures, and to a secondary extent, suicide. So this is just another review of reviews that affirms what we've already said about ADHD, but it's nice to, I think, highlight it because it just continues to provide scientific validation, replication for the fact that ADHD is a public health disorder, not just a mental health disorder. All right, my next review, or study to be reviewed, excuse me, uh, is on the risk of later psychiatric disorders in people diagnosed with ADHD in childhood or adolescence or earlier in life. This is a huge population study out of South Korea. It involves over 350,000 individuals broken into several groups, one of which are those diagnosed with ADHD. It then follows these individuals up approximately five years or more, and then looks at the likelihood that they went on to develop additional psychiatric disorders. And what they found, no surprise, ADHD was linked to a risk of depression later in life, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, as well as uh, several other conditions. What I was surprised at is that they didn't look at oppositional disorder, conduct disorder, learning disabilities, or anxiety disorders. And the risk for those is even higher than the risk for the other disorders that they did look at. So uh, even though the risk for bipolar disorder is elevated, it still remains well below about 6 to 8%, and the risk of schizophrenia in ADHD is even lower, but it is greater than we would see in typical people. So overall, this study out of South Korea affirms what many other studies have found, and that is an earlier diagnosis of ADHD is likely to be associated with the development of additional psychiatric disorders later in life. Uh, and as I said, I think anxiety is certainly one of those that wasn't examined here. Uh, so that said, just again, more replication. Glad to have it within our science. That's what science is all about. Another study, this one I found fascinating. It's not a very big study, but it's out of China. So I thought I'd emphasize it. Uh, and it involves about 30 some children, maybe 31 to 35 children, with ADHD being compared to typical children. But what fascinated me is this is the first time I've actually seen a study of this. They're looking at the capacity of children to perceive biological motion. That is the motion that humans or other organisms would be making with their bodies, specifically uh, human motion. And so they tested these groups by showing them, I'll show it to you here, screens that had patterns of dots on them. And these dots would start to move and either they would be moving as if a human were moving or the movement would just sort of be random or non-biological. And they looked at the capacity of the children to distinguish both global movements of the entire body as well as local movements of the joints, the appendages, uh, and so on. Bottom line, they found that ADHD children were more deficient in their perception of biological motion than were typical children. Now, what makes this new to me is I haven't seen any other study that has talked about this. We've seen more research on autism spectrum disorder being associated with these kinds of deficits in the perception of biological motion. And in ASD, there's also a sort of a, of a devaluing of the movement of social creatures of other humans and a preference 
for repetitive movements such as gear spinning and other things that are more mechanical, systematic, predictable, and recurring. Uh, whereas with ADHD, it just appears to be a deficiency in detecting biological motion, both focal and global. So fascinating study there. I thought that you might want to know about. The last study I'm going to talk about is a neuroimaging study. This one comes out of England, and it is a study of about 60 participants with ADHD, broken down into those who took medication and those uh, excuse me, uh, those who responded to medication and those who didn't, and compares them to a control group of individuals. And what did they find? They're looking at specifically the cerebellum. So let me bring up a diagram that's in the article here. So they're looking at the cerebellum, which is back here at the back part of the brain, and the networks of the cerebellum uh, up into other parts of the brain as well as other parts of the cerebellum. So they're looking at the superior cerebellar projections, uh, and those are the ones in blue here that radiate out of the cerebellum. They're looking at the middle cerebellar projections, and those are in red here, and then they're looking at the uh, ones you see in yellow, which are the uh, in uh, inferior cerebellar networks, and those are the ones down here at the very base of the cerebellum. Uh, and so what they're looking at is how do these projections compare to those of typical individuals? How are these networks, these cerebellar uh, peduncles as they're called, how are they working? And they found that there was a significant difference in the middle cerebellar projections and their activity in adults with ADHD compared to typical adults. They also found that individuals who responded to medication had greater connections in that, in, excuse me, the superior as well as the inferior cerebellar projections, but especially in the inferior projections. So just thought you'd be interested to see yet more evidence for the biological, the neurological nature of ADHD, and also more evidence on the importance of not just the frontal lobe or the basal ganglia deeper in the brain, but of the cerebellum as being involved in the genesis of ADHD symptoms. So there you have it, everybody. That's your review for this week. Again, my apologies for being a bit late, uh, but again, my grandchildren certainly come first, uh, and I hope you'll understand that. So thank you very much, and if you're not a subscriber, as always, think about subscribing. Uh, if you are, thank you for your patronage, uh, and I hope that you find this channel to be informative. Thanks for joining me this week, everybody, and I hope to see you again next week for another research review. Take care, live well, and be well.